men's inheritance, and we're going to do a lot of crazy things today. We just had breakfast. Sorry if you joined us live. You can't. I hope you had breakfast. But we're going to get into worship. We've got Rod Anderson standing by in London, who's going to be sharing the message today about knowing Jesus in the stillness. And I'm excited about this crossing over the sea and the sound that is coming. And the, Rod is a dear friend and a great pastor over in London. And I believe today there's something powerful that's going to happen. So let's stand together wherever you are. Let's put our hearts, lift up our hearts and begin to pray. And then we're going to go into worship. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have called us as men first to go forward, to follow after you, to be men of prayer, men who pray everywhere. In this journey, you define us in Christ. You describe us. You unveil to us Jesus. We see the glory of God in the face of Jesus. And from there, we become. We are transformed. and We are made into the glorious inheritance of for you. Oh, God, we pray today that you will grant us a supernatural connection, impartation, activation, strengthening, greater might, greater power in our inner man, that Christ would dwell in our heart by faith, that we would rise up inside of love and be filled with the fullness of God in all things. Bless you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. You are our high priest. You are our king. You are our inheritance. We are your inheritance. We bless you, Jesus. We worship you. We are intentional in our pursuit, and you are intentional in your apprehension. Hallelujah. So here we go. We receive our worship. Receive us in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's worship. We have come to the heavenly mountain of God. We have come to the city of God. We have come unto millions of angels. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly place. We have come to behold His glory. We have come to receive His love. We have come to the heavenly banquet. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly place. We are living. We have 
seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. Yesterday, I was reading in the Word, and, um, and and I was also reading a lot of stuff online about what's happening in the world and, and just the decline of everything. And and I was asking the Lord, Lord, you know, this really seems like the last days. So, what are we supposed to do? Because it does say in 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 the last days that there will will be persecution, and you can see it rising everywhere. Um, I mean, that's why Greg is here today, because he's been persecuted, you know, and, and kicked out of the country where he was he was serving God. So I was asking the Lord, Lord, what is it? You know, what are we supposed to do? And the Lord said to me, he says, just stay close to me. Just stay close to me. You know, you don't you don't need some kind of a, um, a special plan just stay close to me so you know th this next song inheritance is about that it's about you know being inside Jesus so let's see Stepping inside Jesus, pressing in to know the Father's heart, learning and discovering that who He is is who we are becoming, resting into sunship, to live above our present circumstance, rule and reign from heaven. This is our inheritance. Yes, God. One more time, we're stepping. We're stepping inside Jesus. We're pressing in to know the Father's heart. We're learning and discovering that who He is and who we are becoming. Resting into sunshine, live above our present circumstance, rule and reign from heaven. This is our inheritance to know Him, to know Him, to be fully known, to discover Jesus on His throne, to receive. And be transformed by love and grace to know him to know him to be fully known to discover jesus on his throne to receive and be transformed by love and grace sing that one more time to know him to be fully known, to discover Jesus on his throne, to receive and be transformed by love and grace, to behold the glory in his face, stepping inside Jesus, pressing in to know the Father's heart, learning and discovering that who he is who we are becoming we're resting into sunshine live above our present circumstance rule and reign from heaven 
this is our inheritance. Discover Jesus on his throne to receive and be transformed by love and grace to behold the glory on his face. Yes, Jesus. Lord, we hold your glory. Your glory is face, Lord, Son of God. Son of God, Son of Man, we exalt you. Jesus Christ, risen Lamb, we exalt you. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy. Lord, we praise you, we exalt you. Son of God, Son of Man, we exalt you. Jesus Christ, risen Lamb, we exalt you. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy. Lord, we praise you. We exalt you, Son of God, Son of Man, we exalt you. Jesus Christ, risen Lamb, we exalt you. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy. Lord, we praise you. We exalt you. Come on, sing that. Son of God, Son of Man, we exalt you. Jesus Christ, risen Lamb, we exalt you. King of kings, Lord of lords, Lord, you are worthy. Lord, we praise you. We, one more time. Son of God, Son of Man, we exalt you. Jesus Christ, risen Lamb, we exalt you. King of kings, Lord of lords, you are worthy. Lord, we praise you. We exalt you. Lord, we praise you. We exalt you. Lord, we praise you. We exalt you. Yes, Jesus. We exalt you, Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, yes. Praise the Lord. Take a moment. Welcome in. Go find a couple of your brothers and love on them and share the Christ that's in you with them. And I want to say hi to everybody joining us online. Hey, we're, we're thrilled because we're across the pond bringing Rod Anderson from London live with us in a few minutes and we are a family this pandemic taught me one thing is that in the spirit we are undividable and inseparable and we can be together in the spirit technical technology helping us and not being limited because the actual connection isn't there but now we have a spiritual connection you're loved you have a future and we're going to see great things happen today all right, guys, you're, go ahead and be seated here. We're going to get into, I want to share a couple of things just about inheritance. If you're new to us, we started in February of once a month gathering. And the intent of the gathering was to strengthen men in their pursuit. Timothy, Paul said to Timothy, he said, I would that men pray everywhere. So that gives you an idea to pray constantly and to pray everywhere. So God gave us a simple dream to pray one hour a day, five days a week. All that is in Christ is absolutely ours, but none of it can be ex- secured unless we experientially have the encounter. The knowledge opens the door. Our mind might grasp the thoughts, but after a while, I've got to have the encounter. I had to do. I had to get up really early this morning just because my myself was disconnected from the source, and I needed to return myself to the source, Jesus Christ, and allow Jesus Christ to become exalted before me so that I could be released from the pressure that I was carrying to try to do me. Have you ever noticed that how hard it is to be ourselves and be a source, a source of inspiration? We're called upon it all the time as men. 
We have to go to work. We have to make decisions. We have to lead our family. We have to step into the world that we're in, like Wes just brought up. You know, things are going crazy. What do we do? What are we supposed to do? And what I find is unless I return myself to Jesus, I use this little phrase, I return to Jesus and I turn into Jesus, not in to become him, but inside of him. And I relocate. Because I wake up in the flesh every morning. That's I go to bed in the flesh because that's why I'm going to bed. My body needs to rest. And I wake up in my body and I'm aware of I'm tired or I am had a great night's sleep, bad night's sleep. Got, but then I return and go a step further into Christ experientially. I bring a believing heart, a confessing mouth. I come with Holy Spirit and truth. And I join myself into the truth with the Holy Spirit, and I come into a new place. Every day, five days a week, you practice it for one hour. You don't have to be, we're giving all the tools we've got to teach us to pray books up here, and they're online. They're just a simple way of taking the Lord's Prayer. If you don't have a path, for some people, an hour of prayer seems like, what am I going to do for an hour? I can tell God everything I need him to know in five minutes. But again, this isn't a purpose to petition. This is a purpose to submit. This is all about yielding and surrender. Prayer is about submission to the Christ and who he is and what he's accomplished and allowing all of the truth of who he is to affect who I am. And when we do that, petitions don't even seem to matter because he just starts taking us into the future because he is the future. We were given an inheritance. It says in Christ, in him, we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will. Our inheritance was in God before we even were in God. In other words, we were created with a purpose in Christ. And it, we can struggle all our life trying to get it from the outside in. But if we go from the inside, it just finds its way out. So our day, five days a week, we're doing this through February, I believe. There's a supernatural connection with that process. We, one of the things coming up next uh, month, besides our, we'll meet on the second Saturday. Again, we'll do breakfast at 730. Did you like breakfast? Was that a good idea? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So everybody online, we will we'll figure out how to do that. Maybe, you know, call Grubhub. But <laughs> what we do want to do is next month also on the 23rd to the 25th is our our conference and we're calling it atonement because we want to focus on jesus christ our high priest who now embodies the fullness of god in bodily form and carries all that he accomplished all that god accomplished through him and all that now he functions as a high priest we want to come into a relational perception practice when you when we discover he and him as our high priest, we start to live in the atonement. We live in righteousness consciousness. We go out of the sin consciousness and the trying to struggle to get ourselves right. And so really, I want to ask you something. If you could do this, it would be a big help. Register today and get, get the time off. If we start on a Thursday night, six o'clock, then on Friday all day. We'll start at 10 a.m. We'll have breakfast here. We'll have uh, one or two o'clock in the afternoon. We have lunch together. We have six o'clock evening. We have dinner here. And then on Saturday morning, we have breakfast together and, um, and then 10 o'clock session and then a question and answers at lunchtime. That's uh, it's we're charging $45 so we can have five meals, five sessions be together all the way. I really believe if you will read the book of Hebrews as many times as you can between now and then, if you'll take time off so you don't just, it's not going to, if Larry Napier is coming and he has lived the last 40 years in trying to hold and understand this high priest and his ministry that he carries and what it was Abraham, David. The two men that had encounters with Melchizedek, Abraham, David had it in the spirit. They prophesied. The entire church launched with recognition of this resurrected Christ now being made Lord and this ministry he held. So we want to discover that. It's, it, it's not something that's just 
the first thing you ever learn, but it is definitely where the maturity of the church is coming. And until the maturity of the church comes, then we will continue to be tossed to and fro and carried about by every wind of doctrine and not be able to discern for ourselves where the Lord is, what he's accomplished, what he doesn't have to do anymore, what's already been what we're to do to resubmit ourselves. So I just need you to register because if you don't, I'll tell you what's going to happen. You're going to get extra work that week and you're going to get really busy and you won't come. And then we miss that moment of the of getting to the other side together. That's why we're fasting and praying every Wednesday. The, for the next six Wednesdays, we're going to focus on the, in the fast and on, in the prayer in this 12 hours in the sanctuary just toward, Lord, we want to be a people that are ready to behold the glorified Christ as high priest. Like the apostles were gathered together before the day of Pentecost, they, were in, they, they understood the, that Jesus was resurrected, but they had no power to proclaim it. I believe the power that's going to come to proclaim this completion. And so we don't live in the past. We don't live in the repeat, repeat, repeat. We start to live in this. Oh, he is everything. He is king. He is the resource of any point of life. He is healing now, delivering now, saving now. He's judging the earth now. It is going to require a massive amount of power. And someplace, in some places, people are going to come into a critical mass of submission, humility, pursuit. And then the spirit of God will come with a force that will be beyond Pentecost to wrap this glorious church age up. It will be beyond Pentecost, what's coming. And there's looking for people who are, who are hearing that cry now. Jesus appeared to more than 500 people, but only 120 made it into the upper room. Once the 120 hit critical mass, once God sovereignly said, this was the time, now the hearts are prepared, one accord, one heart, he then moved from 120 to 3,120 in an afternoon. So there's no limitation on God to multiply and increase. What he's limited in is that season of, can I gather a few who will start to pursue and present themselves? And I believe September the 23rd to the 25th is one of those critical mass moments. And I'm, I've never felt so close and so far from something. I've never felt so close to an imminent touch and far, how far yet to touch it's an it's a it's an interesting thing that I've just had to kind of go. God, I'm 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 just here because we can't go further until we get the power. We can't be the witnesses till we understand what we're to be witnessing. We're just going to go repeat old moves and old ideas and treat, keep making Jesus die on the cross and get raised from the dead and then get born on Christmas and die on the cross and get raised from the dead and then thank God we're Pentecostal so then we get the Holy Spirit. But we haven't understood that the high priestly ministry, the last three feasts, are yet to be really seen in Christ so that Christ can be fully seen in his church. And I believe that's what we're doing. So register today, please. We got, we got, we'll register you after service here on the, if you want to give a check or cash or you can go online and do that. Praise the name of Jesus. Mark, I want you to come up and share what. God did because it was it. Not yet. Okay. Okay. All right. So, well, if you're good to share tomorrow, then we'll do that one tomorrow. I'd love to introduce. Hey, we've got Gregory Kuski back from Israel. Why don't you come up? Come on up and say hello. Is it on? No. Yep. Come on up here. Got you right here on the mic. Gregory and Jan Kuski have been in Israel for the last 16 years. Now they've just returned. Welcome. Wow. It's really, it's really good to be back in Jubilee. I see my old friends over here, not, not really in the corner, but in the corner. We used to pray the flags all around the sanctuary. And it was my great joy to come early in the morning and, and greet my friends of the flags. And uh, it's good to be here, man. I see so many new faces. I'm glad to be able to meet you all. And our old friends, it soothes our hearts. And uh, I'm like Mark. My wife is the exhorter. And as I told Dan, I load the dishwasher. 
And uh, so she will come and bring a lot of words soon. But we're really glad to be back. And I just want to say a little thing about what Wes said. It's not, we weren't exactly booted out of Israel. We had been talking about coming back for about a year. Mm -hmm. And uh, then I got sick over the winter and uh, God gave us a window because Israel is becoming a uh, police state right now. If you follow the news at all, it's just not a friendly place to be. It's setting the world example for what they think is to come. And yeah, yeah. we all know that God's plan is God's plan. And uh, Israel, the state of Israel is not in the middle of God's plan. So we're glad to be back. Thanks very much. And uh, we'll uh, talk more later. Yeah, you will. We will. Yeah. Thank you, Gregory. Thank you. Bless you. I, let me add just this caveat. Yeah. Uh, while I was in the hospital in uh, January, we, as you know, we've been applying for residency for years. And no, 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 you have to reapply. And uh, while I was in the hospital, we got a letter, and we don't necessarily read Hebrew very well. As you know, it's a beautiful language, but far different than what we know. And it was a letter from the Minister of Interior inviting us to come down to be interviewed for residency. And so on the one hand, we had to go, and the other hand, they asked us to stay. And so we just had to follow the leading of the Lord and we knew that our time was ending there. We had to come home and do family things and uh, be back with uh, you guys. But here's the secret to life, occupy until he comes. Mm -hmm. And so we can occupy any place that God leads us. I'll have some more words on that after a while, thanks. Yeah, no, that's beautiful. That's, that's super powerful. <clears throat> That's, thank you for that, Gregory, especially that word occupy. It's so important, so important. Christianity has been operating on a false pretense that you can have an experience and then it lasts. No, you must occupy. You know, I just, my heart's been breaking over Afghanistan because of what's happening. But that's not the first time. It was Iraq before that. And it was Vietnam before that. Why? Because... The, medical, the military strategy changed after World War II. It was to come eradicate an enemy and remove yourself and put it back in the hands of another people, not knowing that the hands of the other people once were incapable of holding back the enemy. So as soon as you remove yourself, the enemy returns. In Japan, there are, I visited my ch children when they were stationed there. There is a large presence of American soldiers. In Germany, to this day, there is a large presence of American soldiers. Why? Because at the time of the displacement of the enemy, the military strategy was we will stay here and make our presence felt, give room for growth, but we will not try to remove ourselves and allow things to happen. So think about that in our own walk. If I touch the Lord, and today he's going to do some works in our life, and I do not tomorrow morning get up and go, I want to keep that place. The devil just was driven out of it. Now it's for me to stay in here. That's what Jesus said. He said, when a devil is cast out of a man, it goes about seeking some place to rest, but it can find none. So it goes back and says, I'll go back to the home I once lived in. And goes back and finds the house empty. Maybe clean, but it's empty. And he comes and gets seven times his friends and creates a seven-time catastrophe simply because what was driven out was not replaced with something greater, something stronger. And that's Jesus. We cannot live beyond carrying the fullness of Jesus into the place he's driven the devils out. So praise Jesus. I thank you. Gregory, that's a strong word right there for all of us, because that was the word of the Lord to the church. Occupy until I come. Praise the Lord. Okay, so now I want to introduce uh, Rod. Rod Anderson should be joining us. Come online, Rod. You can put, bring your video up and, your, and unmute your microphone, and I'm going to... There you are. Look at that man. Hey, Rod, welcome. Welcome to you guys. 
It's good to have you. Um, I appreciate all the photos behind you. That's, you know, quite a, <laughs> a new well, look. Again, you, you remember, you asked me to create a small shrine to you. I didn't know why, but I just tried to be obedient. <laughs> all right. Well, whatever you say, the sense of humor will carry us into a new place of freedom. That's for sure. <laughs> Uh, Rod, I'm going to go ahead and step down, and I want you to just take your liberty. Uh, a, a lot of our men know you from, you've been in our church usually every fall conference, but we've not had that freedom this year, but you will, but you will be back, and you pastor the Commonwealth Church. So give, give, us, give, give us a little bit of who you are, and then take us into this word that you're carrying, because I believe it's key for this time we're in. Well, I think uh, probably everybody knows, quote unquote, who we are. I'm Rod Anderson. We pastor Commonwealth Church. And to say the least, Jubilee is part of our family. And we've missed being there a lot. And anyhow, so I just enjoyed looking at you guys and seeing if you came up. I was saddened by the fact that you still have that really crummy guitar player and bass player. But other than that, I mean, you know, it's all good, isn't it? But no, we, you know, I'm joking. I'm sorry. I can't hear any of you laughing, so I better be careful. So forgive me. All right. But no, it is simply good to be with you guys, to say the least. So I'm just going to start. If that's all right, I'm going to pray and um, just jump into some things that the Lord has been dealing with me about. Okay. So, Father, in the holy name of Jesus Christ, whom we serve, we thank you for the incredible grace that's come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Father, that you have endued us with your grace and your power and your wisdom through the Holy Spirit. Jesus, you said, if any man had ears to hear, you said to be careful what we hear. But you spoke over and over again about the importance of listening, of really being aware of who we're listening to and of what we're listening to. And I just give you thanks, Father, for today. I pray that you would truly allow me the grace to communicate some things that are helpful to these men. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ that you, Holy Spirit, do what only you can do. And that's touch, heal, teach, bless, and grant wisdom to all of us as we come together around about your word and your truth. I sincerely ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Somebody wave their hand so I know that you are alive and you're not just kind of figures out there. Can you do that? I just want to make sure. Praise God. Good. Just glad you're there. Steve said, uh, I was going to teach on stillness. I'm going to tell you where this where it is. I'm not going to teach so much as just talk to you <clears throat> about an experience that, you know, about where I've been with Christ over particularly the last uh, 18 months. Over here, we've been in pandemic, <clears throat> you know, for 20 some months. And literally the day before yesterday, they canceled all the restrictions for the first time. So people are able to go to pubs and people are able to go to theaters or cinemas or whatever for the first time. So it's really crazy, you know, how it's been as far as what we've experienced over here. But anyhow, I, I was praying one morning. I have this chair in my living room. I call my prayer chair and every morning I rise early and it's just been my routine since January 2017. God dropped a a grace on me. Um, I wish I could take uh, uh, credit for it, if you know what I mean. But I woke up on that day, started to pray at six in the morning, started to read my Bible actually first. And the long and short of it is I looked up at my clock and it was one in the afternoon. And that has continued ever since January 17th. Now, I have to say there's two or three days that it hasn't been that way. But it's not like I'm a super spiritual. It's just like I said, he put this on me. I I couldn't even believe it that I could sit there for six or seven hours and not even notice the time at all. So to say the least, in the midst of all of that, being just in love with the word of God and just learning to listen, he began to deal with me about some things. And he brought up in my remembrance a book, uh, one of the old books I had in revival. And I mean, it's just like he just, I was sitting there and he just brought this picture up and I like saw this chapter. And it talked about this one group who, whoops, sorry. Can you still see me? 
Hello, sorry about that. Somebody tried to call and it rings on my computer. Apologies. But anyhow, I uh, was thinking he brought this picture to me of revival of this particular uh, testimony or history. And it talked about how, you know, when these people, I think it was up on the Isle of Luz, but how where they, they had incredible manifestations of the power of God. But the point of what I want to get to is they would sit sometimes <clears throat> after a guy would bring a word. And it says that they would sit for four to five to seven hours in absolute stillness. Nobody said a word. Nobody, and it just got me to thinking, I mean, you know, we in the natural can't sit still for 10 minutes, if you know what I mean. There's something about the busyness of our world that just chains us to whatever is going on. But the thing is, these guys had something in them that allowed them to be absolutely still. Nobody said a word. Children didn't say a word. It said for four to six, like I said, four, five, six, seven hours. And then the Spirit of God would just fall and move and create such a an overwhelming display of his power. Then, of course, as you've read another situation, you know, people around the villages would come because they could see the fire and they could see something happening in the, in the physical atmosphere. So, again, God just really hit me that. And he said, you don't know how to be still. He said, you've never really learned how to be quiet. He said, oh, you have quiet moments, but you've never really learned the power. And then he said this word. He said, you've never really learned the art of stillness and what it produces. So that really struck me, it hit me hard. And uh, you know, he reminded me the verse, remember the prophet when he was sitting down and the voice, you know, God's voice wasn't in the earthquake, it wasn't in this, it wasn't in that, but it was in the still small voice. And then he reminded me, I did a teaching on listening a couple of years back and he took me back to one of these old quotes I have. I'm just gonna read it here. This is from High Gain, H-I-G-H, G-E-I, and High Gain, Inc. It's a company that helps business leaders around the world increase their listening skills. But they gave this statistic. Now, I pray that you catch this. We listen, the normal, normally human beings, this is, the, normal, this is the, the base average. Human beings listen at 125 to 250 words per minute. You got that? We listen, we listen. The great difference between hearing and listening, right? Any sound can tickle your ear, but listening is a choice. But anyhow, we listen at 125 to 250 words per minute, but we think between 1,500 and 3,000 words per minute. In other words, we're thinking over 10 times faster about the material that's in our mind. We're thinking like 10 times quicker than we are trying to listen. Uh, and, and it's obvious, say the least, you know, we need with it that our thought life can overwhelm our ability to hear. But that struck me as well. I thought about the good Lord, that's amazing. We, you know, 10 times, we think 10 times faster than we listen. So the basic verse that you all know is for Psalm 4610, where God said this, he said, be still and know that I am God. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. But he stopped me right there and he said, read that first phrase really slowly. And so I thought, okay, be still and know. And then I heard him say this, knowing comes from stillness. Be still and know. He said, the way you're going to really know, and again, that word know is a very reflective Hebrew word. It speaks to a, a, an in-depth intimacy with something, not a casual acquaintance, but an in-depth intimacy. And it just hit me. You know, sometimes you read a verse and it just strikes you like a hammer. Be still and know. He said, you don't know as much as you need to because you don't know how to be still. He said, you need to develop the art of stillness because it is an art. Because in the stillness will come the knowing. He said, there are many things that I want you to know, but you are too busy. You're too busy in your brain. You're too busy in your life. 
you haven't yet obtained the real skill of stillness. And that's where all this began with me. It just really hit me. For whatever the reason, it hit me strong about that. I'm looking at a couple of my notes. So I'm just going to read off a few of them simply because I want to keep this in order. If we're honest, we probably always perceive prayer because that's basically what we're talking about, prayer, learning to commune with God. If we're honest and we ask somebody, or when you think about prayer, again, I would say 95% of what we think about is petition, which Steve just mentioned a moment ago. In other words, we think about coming to God for something he can do for us, right? In other words, and we're framed like that. So basically, that's why in prayer, we find ourselves, you know, we go to we Father, we come to him in the name of Jesus, we begin to ask for whatever it is we need. Not that there's none of that's wrong. But you know, we, we get into this petition mode. But the thing is, when we say amen, as you, I'm sure you've heard this before. But when we say amen, often, that's the end of our prayer. And as they say, you know, God wants a dialogue, he doesn't want a, a monologue. He wants to have the time to talk with us, to speak to us again, more, whatever. But again, we just, okay, prayer time's over. We prayed for that hour. Now I'm going to walk out of the house. And uh, you just never really get as close. You won't really know, know, be intimate with the things Father wants you to be intimate with if you don't learn how to be still and listen. Um, Prayer becomes more what the Father is saying to me than what I'm saying or asking of him. We need to ask ourselves a question, which is more important, which is more powerful in what it produces, petition or communion? That's the thing that began to hit me. Our, our time with the Father in prayer is not to be measured by answered prayer, as it were. I mean, yes, indeed, he answers prayer. We know in Hebrews, it says Jesus is able to run immediately to the cry of those who come unto him, you know what I mean, to help us in our time of need. And of course, that's part and parcel of this incredible covenant of love that we're in. He does that. But still, there's keys. When you study some of the old masters, as it were, the men that walked with God, you know, I mean, walked with God, you know, not just, not just theologically educated, but I mean, men who walked with Jesus, they actually more than being Christians, they were followers of Jesus. I actually don't, and I'm not trying to be pompous, but I don't refer to myself as a Christian anymore. I simply, it just came out of me one day a long time ago, and I just, I'm, I'm doing my, I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm doing my best to follow this man named Jesus, because again, Christianity paints all, all manner of different pictures. But petition or communion, and the Lord kept dealing with me about that. He said, you spend more time in petition than you do in communion. He said, uh, I want you to really work on this and to develop what it means to be with me. He said, you read about those men and women and children who would sit for five and six hours and never speak a word. He said, you have to understand, he said, in many cases, I wait to see if you're serious. I wait to see the intent of your heart. And he said, because I have to deal with, uh, with uh, you in the natural, where you are down there, he said, there's natural means that I look at. And he said, one of them is just that. Are you willing to just sit before me? Just wait before me. Just wait before me. And, you know, I had to practice for a long time how to still my mind, like all of us have. I tell you, the mind does run rampant. We all know that. But, again, this is why you have to, and there's no shortcut to having a personal place of consecration. I mean, every single day, I mean, every single day, you have to develop that personal place of consecration where you set aside some time where you, I don't care when it is, I don't even mind how long it is. The issue is where you intentionally say, Father, here I am, here I am. And then you do, you know, like the last verse of Corinthians says, may the love of God, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the communion with the Holy Spirit be with you all. They call it the grace. But think about that. The, that so those are the three major areas of study the Lord had me dig into all those years ago. That's what he said to me. I want you to 
understand my love above anything else. He said, I want you to dig into the love of God. He said, I want you to pour yourself into the grace that came with me sending Jesus to you. But he said, I really want you to learn what it means to commune with Holy Spirit. He said, I'm up here, as it were. Jesus is at my right hand. My spirit is the one who is with you. Learning to commune with the Holy Spirit, to fellowship, to talk, and then be still enough to begin to listen. Like I said, this is an exercise, like a muscle that has to be developed. Because as I said before, your mind will go crazy with all kinds of what you have to do later, what you have to do tomorrow, all of those situations that are so familiar with each and every one of us if, we're, if we are serious. you know. But again, prayer then becomes a, a situation of responsibility when it shouldn't be. We don't go to prayer out of responsibility, but yet I would say most people do. You know, of all my years of teaching on intercession, Judy and I, for like, you know, that's quote unquote what we were known for for like 34 years is teaching on intercessory prayer. But I got to tell you, you know, it just comes down to the fact, like I said, of hearing God. When I was principal of a Bible school, uh, the question, the number one question that would come from students, I don't care when it was, was always, how can I hear the voice of God? Well, like I said, be still and know. And I pray that doesn't just go over your head because it's so simple and because you're so aware of that verse. The knowing comes from the practice of stillness. And I got to tell you, there's a lot of things the Father wants you to know. There's a lot of things you need to know. And of course, we know what the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2 in the Amplified Bible about the Spirit of God. It says the Spirit will search the deep, the hidden, the profound things of God, the things that are beyond man's scrutiny. In other words, things that are beyond our ability to see in the natural. The Holy Spirit's job is to show us he wants to teach you and I the deep, the hidden, the profound things of God. But you have to be with him for him to teach you, right? And again, you have to learn, like I'm going to repeat myself over and over again, hoping that a few of you will actually catch this. You must develop a skill at being still and learning how to listen with your spirit. And like I said earlier, it's a muscle that you exercise. It's as it were a spirit muscle. And that, you know, like I said, my mind runs a hundred miles an hour. And one of the things that caused me to really change and move towards this is, you know, many, many years ago, um, I was writing curriculum for Bible schools and, you know, Dr. Ed Cole's Christian Men's Network Ed asked me to take each one of his books and create a curriculum for them, which became the Christian, Christian men's uh, curriculum, you know, that's gone around the world. I mean, I wrote it, but then his daughter, Joanne, took it and made it pretty and did all the stuff they, they did for it. But I'm just saying for about three or four years, you know, uh, I, I, I recognize, well, a guy, an old prophet named Bob Lemon many, many years ago, prayed for him and wants to knee. And I'd been teaching, quote unquote, as it were, for, you know, a couple of years. And he prophesied over me and said, from this day forward, you're in the office of a teacher. The Lord is, is promoting you to the office of a teacher. And he prayed over me, laid hands on me, and I felt the spirit of God. But I went back to my seat and I was going, what? Well, I don't understand. I thought I've been teaching, as it were, for three years, three or four years. That's what I do. That's what people invite me to do, as it were. But of course, I didn't understand the difference between teaching and being in the office of a teacher. I didn't understand the difference between pastoring and being able to pastor and being in the office of a pastor or any of the others prophesying. Anybody can prophesy, but there's a great difference between prophesying and being in the office of a prophet. All of those things become very evident as you learn and walk with Jesus. And of course, the difference is the level of anointing that comes. So with me, he, I realized that he'd placed me in the office. He'd given me the gift of teacher. Now, that's not me patting myself on the back, believe me, because of what I'm about to share as far as what happened with me. But the thing is, I never ever, I have never tried to memorize scripture other than the first, for some reason, the first chapter of the book of James. I don't know why, way back when I memorized the first chapter of the book of James. But other than that, I never tried to. But I found myself having such great retention of scripture. I mean, you know, Julie used to call me years ago a walking concordance. And like I said, that it's not a that's not a boast or a prideful statement because of what I, I want to share about that. But the thing is, I just had this great retention of scripture. I was sitting down writing curriculum for some school up in the north of up in Scotland, actually. 
And suddenly something, you know, I stopped and I prayed in tongues for a couple of minutes and something just, I mean, it, well, it wasn't something, it was the Spirit of God just, just like yelled at me and said, you don't know me. I, I know, I just heard, what? I don't understand, you don't know me. And to cut the story shorter, as I sat there with him and listened, I suddenly realized that I had all this incredible knowledge. You know, remember knowledge is just the accumulation of information. Knowledge is not the same as wisdom, is it? Knowledge is a lot of people have a lot of knowledge. They have accumulated a lot of information, but that's not necessarily wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to put those things to work, of course, and much, much more. But I sat there and I suddenly realized it was my greatest embarrassment uh, of my life at the time. And yet it was the greatest blessing in my life because I suddenly realized I knew all this scripture. I could teach on so many things, basically the drop of the hat, you know, the old joke, and I dropped the hat to preach it, to teach it. Right? <laughs> but I had all this information. I had all these scriptures. I, I could just immediately share about this or that the other but suddenly I realized I knew so much of the word of God but I did not know Jesus and that scared the you know what out of me because it was graphic it was profound I'm in the word all the time I was in the word literally seven eight hours a day because of writing curriculum it's difficult work to actually sit down and write and put the things back and forth you know I did that for years so I was always in the Bible I was always in the Bible, but I suddenly realized I don't know Jesus. I know all this word. I know all about him, but I don't really know you. And I sat and I just started to cry because it just struck me, you know, that, wow, I, I, I didn't know that there was a great difference between the two. I had no idea. Christianity is a progression for sure. I always remember back in uh, Exodus, you know, it says God led us here by stages. And that's something that he made evident to me a long time and began to teach me. He said, Every, all life is all about stages. God led his people by stages. And he began to teach me how to recognize the stage I was in so that I could be just, as it were, living correctly towards that. It's just like Jesus when he said, uh, don't be anxious about tomorrow for sufficient of the day is evil thereof. He's never asked us to live more, for him more than one day at a time. And that set me free. A long time ago, he said to me, son, if you'll quit worrying about tomorrow, he said, do you believe me that when you obey me, it releases an anointing? And I thought, well, yes, it does. Every time we obey something you say, indeed, it releases an anointing. He said, then understand this. He said, it's too difficult for you to live five years from right now. You can't make that big of a leap. He said, but if you'll obey me today, this is what I want your spirit to hear. If you'll just be cognizant of being obeyed, obedient to me today, your obedience today will release the anointings that will break the yokes off of your tomorrows. That hit me. It was important for me. I needed to know that because I'm just not, I know that's good to plan. Don't misunderstand me. I know it's good to, you know, they used to teach us when I got saved the Teen Challenge, they'd have these guys come in and you need to have a five-year plan. Then you need to back up in four years. Where do you need to be four years now, three years, two, one, then nine months, six months, three months. Right? But I, I'm just not built that way. I couldn't, uh, couldn't make that leap. But all I know is when he actually began to show me this about live for me today, I got, it just liberated me. I realized that's the most important thing is what's in front of me right this moment, not what's possible going to be tomorrow because tomorrow can change. So anyhow, with all of that in mind, like I said, I didn't know Jesus. I knew a ton of the word, but I didn't really know Jesus, the person. And again, all of that began to this trek, this journey for me to understand the need to how to be still before the Lord. Now, uh, there's a verse I want to read now from about uh, Moses and the wilderness. This is Exodus chapter 33, verses 7 through 11. I don't know if you guys are able to put it up or not, but you'll know this. Now, Moses used to take his own tent and pitch it outside the camp, far off from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting of God with his own people. And everyone who sought the Lord went out to that temporary tent of meeting, which was outside the camp. 
When Moses went out to the tent of the meeting, all the people rose and stood, every man at his tent door, and looked after Moses until he had gone into the tent. When Moses entered the tent, the pillar of cloud would descend and stand at the door of the tent, and the Lord would talk with Moses. I love that. And all the people saw the pillar of cloud stand at the tent door, and all the people rose up and worshiped every man at his tent door. And the Lord spoke to Moses face to face. Isn't that an amazing statement? The Lord spoke to Moses face to face as a man speaks to his friend. Then Moses returned to the camp. Then it says this, but his minister, Joshua, son of Nun, a young man, did not depart from the temporary prayer tent. Now, you got to remember, there were two tents here. The tabernacle had already been erected. The tabernacle was something that God had already instituted. And, you know, when all the tribes of Israel, where they had them in camp, remember, it formed a perfect cross. And right in the center of the cross was, again, where the tabernacle was, which is just speaks so clearly of the fact that in the presence of everything else, the centermost, the centermost strength of our journey needs to be to the presence of God. We need to cultivate the presence more than anything else. We need to learn how to make space for the presence of God. That's why, like in our church services, something, you know, anything can change in a moment. I don't care. I, we have structure but structure is not going to lord itself over the spirit of God. And there's times when, you know what, our worship is so profound that we go for the entire service with nothing but worship. And of course, the opposite can happen. Sometimes I can walk in there or one of our other ministers, and I tell you, it's just they start speaking and there's no need, as it were, for worship because God is so clearly on the message that he's bringing. And those are all things that I'm sure you've heard of as well, but I'm just saying that is still what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to cultivate this sensitivity to where are you leading now, right now? What are you saying right this moment, Holy Spirit? And I'm just saying that all of these things tie up to this practice of stillness. I'm going to quote it over and over again. It's in the stillness that the knowing becomes. Knowing comes from practicing stillness. He really does. I tell you, if I've learned anything, I've learned that. So there were these two tents. And again, you can speak to it in many different ways, metaphorically, but you know, the tent of, of the tabernacle is literally where you brought your sacrifice to God, right? That's where you brought the sheep. That's where they brought the bullocks and what have you, the cereal offerings. But the tent of meeting was a place where God came to you. The tent of meeting was where God came and spoke with Moses. And see, again, today, that's exactly the same pattern that we have here. Know you not that we are the temple of the Holy Spirit. We're the, we're, we're the ones who have the indwelling in the center of our life. But he longs to come to us. You can't have one without the other if you want to have a good Christian journey. You need to have a place of revelation of the sacrifice, of bringing the sacrifice and Lord, being faithful with your tithes, being faithful with, you know, your support of your local church, being faithful, all those things. That's half of it. But the other half is learning to listen. I mean, learning to listen. I, I My people are probably, say, they said sometimes I'll say it's, you know, like five, ten times in the middle of the meeting. There's no shortcut to a personal place of consecration. It's the most important issue of your life. Because again, it's when you train yourself to hear and quiet your mind, that's when knowing begins to happen. And that's when peace, you know, the Bible says there's a peace that passes all understanding. We all know the verse. I can hand on heart testify to you that since this took place in my life, we've had several traumatic situations, to say the least, happen. But I find myself in a place of peace. I've actually got to the place where I'm no longer anxious. And I mean, I'm no longer anxious. Anxiety still tries to come once in a while. But it's just like, nope. He's, he's brought a peace to me 
that I really can't explain. I'm not trying to sound super spiritual. I just can't explain it. I just don't get ruffled like I used to at times. I don't know if it comes with age or whatever, but I knew I do know it's come with being in the Word so much and just learning to shut up and listen. Just sit back. I'll close that book in there, and I put my head back, and like I said, I just say, here I am. I've learned to not be afraid of stillness. I've learned not to be afraid of silence. But, uh, but really, you know, assess yourself, examine yourselves. How difficult is it for you to remain still? How long can you go without thinking you need to do something? And again, it's not that you may not need to do something. But again, I'm saying our priority is the Lord Jesus Christ and his spirit. That's still our priority. And, how, you know, how, how many different ways do we have to try to say this as ministers of the word? Life goes better when you obey what Jesus said to do. Life is better when you follow the instructions of the Father. None of his commandments are grievous. None of them. They're all for our benefit. Even the hard sayings of Jesus are for our benefit, right? I mean, they really are. Every word that God has spoken to us is a saving word. I said it's a saving word. That's why you begin to delight yourself in the word. And that's why then your heart begins to have the desires that he gives, not just your desire for a new car. He begins to give you desires. Your desires become God-given desires. That's actually what this verse speaks to. Because the word delight there means to be soft and malleable like clay. And it means the moment when you actually learn to present yourself before God and relax. Be soft and pliable, something he can work with, something that the potter can work with. That's when he will give you something, right? Amen. Well, there's so much there. Another verse always spoke to me as well as Zechariah 3, 7. But don't panic. I'm coming almost to the end, like I said. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, and you need to read about the charge. The charge was to be, you know, to follow him and to obey him and to be with him at all times. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my charge, then also you shall rule my house, and you'll have charge of my courts. Now, remember, we read about that passage about Moses, the tent of meeting. Remember how that last verse where Joseph remained at the tent of meeting? That always hit me. Joseph didn't want to leave the place where God appeared to Moses. Now, listen to me. Joseph did not want to leave. Moses walked away and back to the tribes. Joseph said, I'm going to stay here a little longer. And that so ministered to me because about two and a half years ago, I, I prayed and I stopped. And the Lord just said so clear to me, he said this simple statement. He said, I want you to linger a little longer. I want you to linger. I, I love the word linger. I don't know what better. He said, I want you to linger a little longer. And I began to practice lingering. <laughs> it's all part of the same thing, but just stay a little while. And when you think about Joseph, it really hit me, you know, him staying at the tent. It really hit me that he became the leader after Moses. And the Lord said to me to a vast degree, lingering at my tent and meaning is what qualifies you for true leadership. Something happens when you hang around where the presence is. And of course, like I said, again, I know what theology teaches. His presence is within each and every one of us as born again believers. But like I said, there has to be this intention. There has to be this desire that's, uh, that again, like, you know, Steve said earlier, he goes to bed in the flesh, he wakes up in the flesh. Trust, you know what he means by that. Flesh is not a bad thing because you have to have flesh for the, you and the Holy Spirit to live in it. It's just when you let your flesh overrule, you know, your spirit and your soul. But the point is, the exercise of spiritual truths brings spiritual breakthroughs. I don't know how else to put it. So, but then he said this. I want to read the verse again. Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you walk in my ways and keep my charge, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts. And I love this. Steve knows this well. And I will give you access to my presence and places to walk among these who stand here. 
I will give you places to walk. And this is, this is an angel, the angel Lord speaking to. He said, I, if you'll do this, I'll give you access. I love that thing. To, I'll give you access to my presence, and I'll give you a place to walk among those who stand there. In other words, he said, I'm going to let you walk in heavenly places. Now, that may not excite you, but it excited me. And, of course, it just lends itself to the absolute knowledge that there is a higher life. That's why, of course, we all know what the Lord Jesus said. If you lay down your lower life, you can pick up a higher life. There's always another level. You all know these verses, too. I've quoted them at Jubilee many times. He said he'd take us from faith to faith, from strength to strength, from glory to glory. Everything's by levels. One level of glory to the next level. One level of faith to the next. One level of strength to the next. But it's always our responsibility. It's always our decision to, yes, I want more. So I'm going to do what it takes to get more. And like I said, a crucial part of that is developing this time alone with God and developing this time of stillness. I'm telling you, there's just no substitute. And one of the things he told me in the midst of this, he said, if you'll keep cultivating the art of stillness, he said, you'll wind up seeing yourself as my apostle John did. Now listen to me. I'm going to say that again. He said, if you'll just keep cultivating this art of stillness, you'll wind up seeing yourself as John did. And what I mean is that, well, it's a few places, but John chapter 20, verse 2. He said, remember John said this about himself, I'm the disciple that God loves. <laughs> Think about that. It sounds like a boast. It sounds like a prideful statement. But, uh, hi, guys. I just want to tell you, I am the disciple that God loves. But catch that. Where you are at, where it is such an absolute truth, such an absolute revelation to you that you have no hesitancy in saying, I'm, I'm, I'm the one that God loves. And see, that's what begins to happen because, again, God is love. And the first thing he'll always produce, if you give him time, is the fact that you are indeed absolutely accepted in Christ. Absolutely accepted. No condemnation. The righteousness of God. You are in right standing with God. All because, again, not your behavior, but because of Christ's behavior. I'm right with God. You're right with God. And one day, you know, it's easy to say it, but like I said, it's another thing to actually go, I'm the man God loves. And that becomes your identity. I'm the man God loves. And you know what? I am the man that God loves. I am. He loves me. Don't know about you, but he loves me. Hallelujah. I think it's because I'm from Bakersfield. At least that's what I told Steve. Anyhow, hallelujah. Praise God. I found I needed to move from prayer being done from a sense of responsibility to move to a place of seeing it rather as an opportunity for encounter. And why, again, you see, I used to be very, quote unquote, responsible to my prayer time. But um, anything can become religious, can it? You know what I mean? Anything. And uh, the moment it's religious, there's no power attached to it. It really isn't. There's a big difference between religion and Christianity. Religion, even the word I think I've shared this church, religion, R-E is a prefix, means to return again into legion, L-E-G-I-O-N, is really from legere, which means a bond or chain. And what happens if you get religious, you, you go again into chains, a bondage. Now, originally, initially, the word meant to go into the bond of Christ. But we have allowed over centuries for religion to me to be a, a move into basically bondage to some man's doctrine that Jesus never taught. I found I needed to move from prayer being done from a sense of responsibility to seeing it rather as an opportunity for encounter. That's why I do, you know, we joke back and forth, Steve and I, but, you know, one of the reasons I respect Steve so deeply is because it's very evident to anybody who has followed Jesus that Steve has had legitimate encounters with the Father. Legitimate. I mean, it's just real. Nothing's put on. He's a genuine article. He's authentic. Anything that has authenticity truly ministers. That's one of the things that people recognize. Have you ever had a... Uh, remember in the old days when a salesman would come to your door and knock on the door and begin to want to sell you Encyclopedia Britannica or sell you, uh, you know, door-to-door, -door, uh, um, you know, vacuum cleaners or something to that effect. 
But even when people come to talk to you about anything, you can tell in a moment when they're reading or telling you what they know from a script, can't you? Do you know what I mean? You can so sense this is coming from a script. And there's just all the difference in the world from knowing something from a script and having revelation of it. You've heard this old illustration as well years ago, there was a speaking club, uh, like a speech club, what have you, and they would pick different topics, remember, to, to share on, and they'd give two people every night, they'd give like, take out three teams or two, and they'd have them speak on something, give them a little text to read, have them speak, and then the people would decide who, quote unquote, brought the greater emphasis, brought the greater result from the way they were able to speak and communicate, you know, the truth. Well, this young man and this old man were given the topic of Psalm 23. So the younger man, he came up and he said, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. And, you know, he put all this strength and, strong and stuff behind it. And he reads the whole psalm and everybody applauded and clapped because he did such a good job. And the old man got up. He read the same psalm. But very differently, you know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He, and when he finished the psalm, everybody was in tears. And the young man said to the moderator, he said, I don't understand. He said, I, I don't understand the reaction here. He said, I, I said it with much greater grace and much more, you know, momentum here in these areas, what have you like that. And he said, people applauded me, but why are they crying? And of course, I'm sure you've heard this, but it still rings true. He said, well, it's very simple. He said, you knew the Psalm, but this old man knew the shepherd. And that's just it. It's all the difference in the world. You can know the word and not know the shepherd. <laughs> I wanna know him now at my age, you know, I'm 74 years old. You know, we're talking to today. You know, we have to take, you know, we, I'm not fatalistic, but I'm realistic. I'm thinking, how many more years do I have? I'm 74, you know, 10 years, I'll be 84. You know, people, you know, die in the 80s or whatever, 90s. Julie's got real good genetics in her side of the family. I don't think I have bad ones, but I don't feel any, I don't feel any hesitancy in my spirit at all. I feel good in my spirit, but I have to tell you, you get older, your body does start talking to you. I don't know if anybody's noticed that or not, but it, it's crazy. But anyhow, I said, Julie, we have to actually start thinking, you know, we maybe got 10 more years. We might, I mean, think about how quick time flies. I said, you know, we could be out of here. And within the next 10 years, one of us, both of us, whatever. And like I said, I'm not fatalistic, but it's just that I really began to think, okay, but what's the most important thing then for me at this point in life? We have this church I'm grateful, like I said, God, show me who's to take this over so our succession. And man, I'm telling you, within six months, all of these three people rose to the top that have giftings in them that just thrill me with their ability to communicate Jesus. And I was just thrilled, but I took that as a sign, you know, that God's saying, yeah, it's, it's, everything's right on track. Everything's right on track. But I have to say, in the midst of all of that, again, it's because I've been seasoning myself with this sense of what it means to learn to be still. I, I know that I'm repeating myself over and over again, but I'm just praying with truly a, the greatest might that I can. Yeah, you know, I love Jubilee. I mean, you know, we our hearts are knit to this church unlike any other church we've ever known, simply because of what God did between Julie and I and Steve and Cammy is just just it's supernatural kinship, a supernatural friendship. It's just, it, it is. It's, I don't try to figure it out. It just is. But see, I know that we're all in transition. I mean, it, we're always in transition. But there's all manner of things. The world, this pandemic stopped the world, didn't it? It's unparalleled in history. What's really taken place in a in a in context of being in a world that's this sophisticated with this amount of technology, but that stupid little bug brought everything to a halt, and it took all manner of people either out of church or to create a church in their own house, which is what happened. I loved one post I saw a while back or oh, a long time ago. Now said Satan thought he was closing the church when he actually birthed five hundred more churches, all small ones, in people's homes. But what's happened during this time, at least over here, I'm sure it's happened there too, is 
a lot of people have just got, like I said, out of the habit of going to church. They just think, well, it's okay. I'm happy to watch it online. I'm happy to do this, that, the other. And we know it flat out says, do not forsake the fellowshipping of one another. Don't forsake that. Stay together. Stay together. The gathering is important. The presence is the most important. The gathering is still important. But anyway, I'm just saying, so this is why I, I honestly am not trying to be melodramatic. But please take this with the sincerity that I'm trying to communicate it to develop the art of stillness. I cannot say this enough. It's in the stillness that the knowing comes. I know things now that I never knew before. I mean, I had a theory of some things. I had as it were even some evidence of some things. But I discovered it, it was very different from actually knowing, like the Apostle John, I am the man God loves. See, I could quote the book where God loves me, this I know. You know what I mean? You, we can all say that. I know, yeah, God loves us. But I woke up knowing that God loves me, that I, I'm the apple of his eye. He adores me. He knows every dumb and stupid fracture in my life. And he just flat out uh, lo loves me, adores me. And I can't, you know, it's so easy to preach that as it were and say it, but the peace, it's like you find yourself taking a deep breath and it's like, it's all over. It's okay. It's all right. I'm just here until I go home. But all I can say is the greatest value I've ever experienced has come from this art. And I'm still not finished with, to say the least, this stillness. So I found I needed to move more from prayer being done from a sense of responsibility to seeing it rather as an opportunity for encounter. And to me, that became everything. And one final thing I want to say, I mean, we know these verses, draw near to God, he'll draw near to you, James 4, 8. And I hope you think that's true, because it is true. You cannot intentionally sit down to draw nigh to God in prayer without him coming closer because he's not a man that he should like. See, just knowing something that simple thrills me. Every time I sit in there in the morning, I know he's coming closer. Yes, he's in me. I know theology, but I know there's something, there's a greater level. There's something more getting near to me because I'm drawing near to him. And that just makes me want to linger because I believe that. See, this is the thing. You can know scripture, but not believe scripture. You can know all these sayings, but not believe them, not really believe them. But I don't, like I said, I'm sorry for saying it over and over again, but believing comes from the stillness. Believing comes from this from so the knowing comes and suddenly you say, I believe. And you do, <laughs> you actually do. Joshua 1, eight, we all know the verse says, this book of the law shall not part of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein that, mightest, that thou mightest observe to do according to all that's written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous and you shall do wisely and have good success. And you may not think about it, but even meditation is worship. Even meditation is prayer. Because why? Because you're sitting there thinking. In other words, when you look at this word every day, even without talking, it's prayer to God. Every time you truly yield to worship and you don't put your hands up because somebody told you to, but you put your hands up because you cannot help but put them up, that's prayer. That's communing. All of that is. I'm just sharing what I'm sharing today, hopefully, that I'm trying to help you to know that there's a whole lot more to prayer than petition. The greatest abundance of what God wants to provide for you and I doesn't come from our petitioning him. It comes from our being with him and the tent of meeting. And uh, truly the final thing I wanted to share that I told, uh, and I'm just going to finish with this, is I've taught there on tongues before, but you know, I'm just going to say a couple of the same things that I said when I taught there years ago. I, I, hopefully you'll all agree with me that the scripture says that all of the gifts of the spirit function as the spirit wills, right? Is that correct? First Corinthians 12, first Corinthians 14, 13, 14. The gifts manifest as the spirit of God 
as the Spirit of God wills them to do so. Is that right? Somebody shake their head. I'm going to try and see if I can see anybody shake their head. I don't, can't tell who I see a hand, but anyhow. But, and this is what always struck me. This is what hit me all those years ago when I started teaching on tongues a lot. If it's true, I mean, you can't just turn on the gift of healing. You can't just turn on the gifts, the working of miracles. You can't just turn it on at will. You can't turn any of them on at will because they move, they manifest as the Spirit of God wills. But why is it that, is tongues a gift of the Spirit or not? So you have to answer that. Yeah, it is. It's listed in the nine gifts of the Spirit. It, speaking, you shall speak in other tongues. It's a gift. But isn't it so that those of us who are baptized in the Holy Spirit, I can speak in tongues right now, right? And you can too, correct? Again, just help me a little bit. It's tough, you know what I mean? I'm used to being in front of people and yelling at them and seeing somebody respond. But yes, I can speak in tongues anytime I want to. And it struck me. And then I remembered something Brother Hagin said to us all those years ago. And he's the one that made this statement. He said, we've always said, it's been taught for many years. He said, the tongues was the least of all of the gifts. But he said, what if that was in, what if we had that totally wrong and it's the actual reverse? What if tongues, why has God made it the most easily accessible of all the gifts of the spirit? Why has God made tongues, which he says is a gift of the Holy Spirit? Why has he made tongues the most easily accessible of all of the gifts of the Spirit. I know Dad Hagen, you say, he said, I think maybe it's possibly the most important gift of the Spirit. That's why the devil's done everything to dumb it down, to say it's an act of the devil, to tell people, you know, to make people too lazy. In fact, just about what, what is, we're in, yeah, in August, uh, in May, the, <laughs> I'm sitting and rather praying, and the Lord just out of nowhere. I'm just, I think I was reading the book of Romans, all of a sudden, I, said, I just heard this real loud You're lazy. <laughs> and I went, well, you know, I thought somebody was in the room. And I said, What do you mean? He said, You're lazy. And I, th and I just stopped, you know, I started to listen. I said, Lord. And yeah, it was him. He said, You're lazy. And I said, Father, uh, what? And he said, You don't speak in tongues near the, or the minute, near as much as you used to. He said, you've gotten lazy. He said, you've forgotten the power and the unction behind it. Just get back to it. He just said that stuff, but get back to it. I'm telling you, tongues, again, I'll just quote Dad Hagen. He said, tongues, the more you speak in tongues, the more sensitized you are to the move of the Holy Spirit. It is the Holy Spirit. Remember, the Holy Spirit within me prays, Paul said. When I pray in tongues, my, it's my spirit prays by the Holy Spirit that's within me. My spirit prays. It's not the Holy Ghost praying. That's why you can start praying in tongues, because it's your spirit that starts to pray. Now think about it. This is so vital. Your head and emotions can pray a ton of stuff, but your spirit needs to pray. This prayer needs to come from your spirit, man, far more than from your head. Or from you know somebody's asked you to pray about that. That's fine. But see, I'm talking more about your private, private devotional life. You men who are called to be men of God and followers of Jesus Christ, not people that just sit in a chair, but people that actually have made the decision, I want all of Christ in me that I can get. I want all the wisdom that I can get. I want to know some things. Why? Why is all this important? Because we're called to help people. It's all about helping people. There's nothing more important to the Lord God than this love of his to get the lost and to really get to them. And that's the issue. See, the more sensitized you are to the spirit, the, know you, the more you'll, you will have a word in due season. The more you'll be able to be in a, in a I don't remember the name of the stores over there. Uh, you know what I mean? Supermarket. You'll be in a supermarket. You'll be in an alpha beta or whatever. And, you know, and you'll sense him saying, go talk to that man. And we all know stories like that, but I'm just saying tongues. Another part is Paul says in the 14th chapter, he says, he who speaketh in an unknown tongue, remember, speaks not unto man, but unto God. How be it in the spirit, he speaketh mysteries. Well, again, that's enough for me to want to pray in tongues more because it says categorically, when I speak in tongues, I'm speaking not to man, I'm talking to God. Now, I've got to tell you something, 
talking to God without any in, in any kind of a distraction can't be bad. Every time I open my mouth and speak in tongues, I'm talking directly to God. Knowing that my father is the gentleman that he is and that he is the life giver that he is, I know that can't be bad. I know that if I can talk like that to him, it's not going to be a one-sided conversation. It can't be. He loves me too much. He wants to get information to me. He wants to get wisdom to me. He wants to give direction to me. So I repeat. So I, uh, you know, hallelujah. I get to talk to God. I'm going to talk to you, Father, right now. I don't have to understand it all. And that's the thing, again, your brain goes crazy. Your brain wants to understand everything. Some things of the spirit you will never understand until you get to heaven. You just make the decision to be obedient. And then the understanding will come. It will come in time when you're able to handle it. Remember when Jesus said to the disciples, he said, there's many things I could tell you, but he said, you simply can't handle them right now. They weren't mature enough. He had it all, could have given them a ton of answers, but he knew that where they were able to receive actually dictated what he was, what he was able to offer. And all I know is praying in the spirit, praying in tongues a lot, and like I said, practicing this art of stillness, suddenly you begin to know things come in. Uh, people use different terminology, but all I know is understanding begins to come about things. You look Right now, I've often been asked to be a mediator in situations in churches, and there's two, there's a big church in a town north of London, about 35, 40 miles that I've known for years, used to minister there. Long story short, I'm mediating between them, and uh, there's a church board, and there's a land trustee, a church trustee board. Anyhow, and there's two guys that are that are very sophisticated. One's a surgeon, and one's a very high-level businessman, CEO of a large company. And they're on this one board, and but sadly, you know, they they have all this knowledge, but they don't know Jesus. And the pastors that I've known for like 35 years, they know the Lord. And they're trying to share some of the things, how the Spirit of God's leading them. These guys can't read it because to them, they don't know the way of the Spirit. And I'm just saying, so it's a big um, confusion, a big problem has come up. And they're, it's just too much to go into. But what I mean is they've asked me to come and mediate. So I have to sit here between, you know, these two or three men that I know follow Jesus and then these other three men who are wonderful guys are beautiful quote unquote Christians, but they don't know the way of the spirit. They can't hear, they can't understand what it means to be led by the spirit and what it means to risk, uh, what it means in ministry, in ministry that sometimes you step out into things that you don't have a natural reason for. You know what I mean? There's another situation, a horrible uh, Im immoral situation happened in another church and I'm having to mediate and try to bring healing to that. I'm just saying that when you, it's just remarkable when you are in a situation like that, that you've learned how maybe to actually, Holy Spirit, what do you want to say right now? You know, I've got my idea. I've got a quick mind. God gifted me with a very quick mind. Like I said, it's got in my way most of my life. And I've had to learn to list, like I said, to just shut this thing down and to lean not to my own understanding. But it's amazing when you do find yourself having words that just evidently come from heaven. And you get the phone calls later where, you know, people are just saying how much it helped them. I'm like, Please hear me. I'm not patting myself in the back. I'm just saying this is available to all of us. I'm far from, you know, having reached some pinnacle of holiness. <laughs> but I've learned a few things. You know, 74 years old now. I'm still a youngster. Hallelujah. I still feel like I'm 17 on the inside. And that's crazy when you feel 17 on the inside. I'm honest to God, I feel 17 on the inside. I, people get embarrassed. They introduce me at church, and when the visitors come, they say, we want you to meet our pastor. He's not normal. <laughs> Cracks me up. They think because I'm just whatever. Anyhow, meditation. Anyhow, so just this thing about tongues. And the other part of that, and you know, I will, I will finish, Steve, with this. I really will. There's two tons of stuff, you know, teach this stuff in eight-hour segments about tongues. But when he said, when a man speaks in an unknown tongue, he speaks not unto men, but unto God. He said, how be it in the spirit? He speaks mysteries. A great word there is musteo. It's spelled, I think, if I remember correctly, M-U-S-T-E-E-U-O. And you know what? The actual definitions, I think it's in Vines as well as in a couple of other lexicon. It literally says to become an initiated one. And another thing says to be initiated into a greater level. How be it in the spirit, you speak mysteries. 
the more you speak in the spirit, the more you find yourself being initiated into another group, as it were, another band of people who have more knowing than some of the other bands of people. Can you hear that? Do you, do you hear what I'm trying to say? All, and that's just from this tongues that is the most easily accessible gift of all the gifts. And my final statement, it really will be the final statement, will be this one, but where Paul, I, you know, think about it. You do know that Paul is said to have written some two thirds of the New Testament, right? Upon which 80%, right at 80% of all of our Christian actual doctrine comes from, is from the Pauline epistles, 80% of all of our Christian doctrine about the resurrection, the resurrection of the just, the right standing that we have with God, all of these things come greatly from the Pauline uh, epistles. And think about this. Remember what Paul also said in the 14th chapter? He said, I pray in tongues more than you all. He said, I wish that you would all pray in tongues. I pray in tongues more than you all, but I'd rather have somebody pray with their understanding than 10,000 words in tongues. But did you hear him say that? And it hit me, and I just heard the Lord say to me once years ago, but he said, think about it. He said, 80% of the New Testament revelation comes from the Pauline epistles. God chose a man who spoke in tongues more than them all. Think about it. <laughs> Try to see the connection. He chooses a man who evidently gave himself the tons and tons of praying in tongues, and he writes two-thirds of the New Testament, this guy who spoke in tongues more than them all. I pray in the name of Jesus that you will see that means something that's rather profound, okay? So I'm done. Be still and know that I am God. Be still. Be still. Knowing comes from developing the art of stillness. Yeah, I, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Before you go, Rod, I'd just like to make a, a door for any questions. Anybody have a, you know, what you shared was huge. I, I love your teaching. You know, I can always tell a teacher because the, the authority of the word unlocks your spirit and calls you into your identity. And you can feel freedom. You can feel authority. Yes, Tom. We'll, we'll, we're going to just get you so you'll be heard. Rod can hear you. I just want to say I love the idea of being still to hear the voice of Christ. I've struggled with that myself. But here's another thing I've struggled with forever, pastors. This speaking of tongues thing, I just don't get it because I've never really spoken tongues. Okay. Well, the beautiful thing is we'll pray for you today if you want to, and we'll, you'll be filled with the Holy Spirit and speak in other tongues because that's definitely for all of us. So. Then you'll get it. <laughs> but, right, but before I, we get into some, go ahead, Lurt, right. I was just going to say to that gentleman, remember that Jesus said, if your earthly father being evil knows how to give good gifts unto the children, how much more will the father give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? It's so simple. The devil's made it, again, something that you have to try to sophisticate with your sophisticated intellect, try to figure out if your intellect has nothing to do with being filled with the Holy Ghost. It's belief. If you ask him, I guarantee on the authority of the scripture, he will give it. It's up to you to receive it. And then to believe five places in the book of Acts where they received the Holy Ghost and they spoke with other tongues. So you believe it because you see the authority of the scripture, not any of our ability to whatever. Okay, that's all I want to say. So have that in your spirit. Wonderful, wonderful. We, we will be pray for you today, Tom. Uh, anyone else? Question? Uh, something you heard that you'd like to understand better? Uh, yeah. Tim. Thank you, Rod. In addition to all that you said, do you have any other specific techniques of getting rid of racing thoughts while you're praying? <laughs> Yeah, you just simply cast them down and say, that's not my thought. Brother Hagen used to say this years ago, and I'm sure that it's, it's, you've all heard this. He said, he used to say all the time to us, you can't keep birds from flying over your head, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. 
thoughts are something, you know, you actually, again, it's a choice. And I went through that, you know, I was in prison, you know, three times, uh, they know my testimony there, most of them, everything is surrounded by pornography, you know, nude pictures everywhere, all this crud constantly, and no matter, even, you know, whatever. And so you can't, you're just constantly there and everybody that, you know, the pornography wasn't a big deal back in those days because there wasn't such a media presence as it were. But all I'm getting at is uh, first, don't be condemned because the devil's number one job is to keep you confused. His number one job is to keep you abstractly away from the things of God. So, of course, the moment you go to do anything that's holy, that's sanctified unto heaven, well, of course, hell, you know, Jesus said Satan comes immediately to steal the word. So the moment you want to act on something that is the life where the life of God is, Satan does come immediately. But see, when you know that, you're forewarned, you're forearmed. So you recognize that. But what I had to understand is, like I said, I'm right with God because of Jesus, not because of Rod. I'm right with God. And I knew that I had to learn to cast down imaginations I mean, there's a ton of, oh my God, help me, Steve, I'm about to go into a two-hour teaching. <laughs> but, you know, mm. casting down imaginations, pulling down strongholds, I'm saying it backwards, right? pulling down strong, casting down imaginations and bringing into captivity every thought to the mind of Christ. He said you can bring every thought into captivity to the mind of Christ. I believe that. I've done that. I no longer am uh, an am, uh, What's the word? I'm no longer shaken by bad thoughts because I've learned to recognize they're not mine. I'm a good man. I'm a holy man because of Jesus now, not because of my behavior, but because of his. But it hits, it's hit me so strong that when those foul thoughts come, I recognize them. That's not who I am. I rebuke you. Get out of my head. Just get out of my head. I mean, I just do that. I would go and stand in front of the mirror and I would do this on a daily basis. I did this for maybe three years. I would go in front and I would stand and stare at myself and say, Rod Anderson, you're a holy man. You're right with God through the blood of Jesus Christ. You're a holy man. You're no longer that drug addict. You're no longer that man of violence. You're no longer that man of whatever. You're just not, you're right with God. I mean, I had to tell myself who I was. Like Steve taught, everything's about identity. I don't identify with my own old self. I surely don't identify with thoughts that are that are contrary to the will of God. And again, as hard as that may sound to some people, it's that easy. You simply say, I'm not going to think on that. And of course, you need to be wise. Don't watch stuff that gives you images that always create the opportunity for lust. Don't read stuff and don't, you know, you know, when you, they used to teach us years ago, in the old days, remember, they used to have the sex magazines on the top it, you know, so the kids couldn't get to them. There'd be shelves and shelves. Now, again, I'm showing my age for sure. But like this old guy, you say, said, just don't look up. <laughs> don't, you know, Jesus said very clearly, Paul said it to Timothy in the pastoral epistle, you know, you know, run from the places of temptation. Literally get up and run. Don't, I mean, see it. You have to understand he wants to kill you. He wants to kill you. He wants to destroy your life, destroy a marriage, destroy a life. He's actually after you, your life. He wants to destroy. You have to see it that serious. You have to learn to hate evil. One day they asked me what I was going to teach on at a church, and I said, I'm going to teach on perfect hatred. The pastor freaked out. He didn't know what I was talking about. And I said, no, I'm talking about the fact that God said in his word in Proverbs and in Psalms, he said, you have to hate sin. David said, you have to train yourself to hate it. I mean, hate it with an aggression. And so when that stuff would come, it made me mad. I didn't get weak. And I used to go, oh, my God, why am I thinking that? Just like you do. Oh, I don't understand. Why am I being bombarded with these thoughts? It's because you unknowingly, unmeaningfully, you're allowing them. Like I said, because he's given you the authority to cast them down. You see, if you keep thinking about something long enough, it goes to the next stage where you get imaginations. What's the root word of imagination? Image. You think about something long enough, you start to get images. If you imagine things long enough, it can lead into a stronghold. As long as it's just a thought, you can deal with it. Even if it's an imagination, you could deal with it. But if it's gone to a stronghold, that's where you do often need somebody to pray for. You don't always, but you need somebody to pray for it. But see, we always look at that in the negative. If I can get you to thinking the word of God, 
Think on those things for a lovely, pure, honest, just, a good report. If there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on those things. If I can get you to actually be intentional and start that job, start that journey, get that book out, get those scriptures out every day, and just understand this is life. This is life. They're life unto me. They're health on my flesh, but they're life unto me. They're life unto me. I mean, you got to yell sometimes. You just got to get serious about it. You know, I have to train people. I have to train Englishmen how to yell and be passionate. They don't know how to. Oh, my God, I'm sorry. I shouldn't be that loud. Oh, goodness. <laughs> but if I can get you to think good thoughts long enough, guess what? Those good thoughts become imaginations. And you start seeing yourself blessed. And you keep seeing yourself like God sees you long enough. And guess what? It can become a beautiful stronghold in your life. I know I'm loved by God. But you just cast them down. You actually tell them to go. You recognize they're not my thoughts. That's the devil. Like I said, birds bringing stuff by to see if I'll bite. Satan's a good fisherman. He always knows the bait that we used to bite, used to uh, you know bite on. So why change bait if we keep biting on it? But that's why you just quit biting it. I'm not going to take that. No, no, I'm not going to take that. I'm not going to linger and look into that woman, hot weather, low cut dress. What I'm not going to check it out. I'm not. I do. You choose. You make the flipping choice. You man up and you make the choice. I'm going to look that way. I don't need that in my life. And I, do you think I'm saying that's easy at first when you first get started to stuff? No, because your flesh will rail and jump and kick because Satan's had you for so long. He knows he's got that in you. But remember, Jesus said that the wicked one comes and he finds nothing in me that he can attach himself to is what it says in the Greek. There's nothing in me Satan can attach to. And that's a giant revelation, you know, I had that all these years. Is there something in me that he can attack? Is there something there that actually is kind of his? And I just rebuked it. I said, no, no longer. I repent of that. I reject it. I, I renounce it out of my life in the name of Jesus. I'm, anyhow, I'm sorry. But yeah, no, you just uh, tell those racy thoughts. You're not mine. Get the hell out of my life. This is what you do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you that go. is, that is hell. You get that hell yeah. out of your life. Yeah. Okay. One, we got two more questions and then we're going to have time for prayer. Yeah. Well, hi, Rod. Uh, what a great teaching. You're such a uh, patriarch of teaching. I think that was your best teaching. I uh, heard you many, many times. Um, thank you. Don't forget um, to speak. Of, don't, forget to speak of, don't forget to speak about my humility. Oh, oh wait, 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 wait. <laughs> I love your background. Is that like Mick Jagger behind you? Oh, that's, that's the shrine that Steve asked me to put up. We only light the candles at night. Bro. <laughs> I had to get that in because I kept on looking. And then you, you're just a jokester. And he'll get you back next time. But um, I know. Uh, a little word. My, my, I, I, my, for my wife, my wife goes to work. We always walk and pray around the block. And she's... She asked me, Ed, how was your quiet time? Mm. And I go, uh, I, uh, I him and all. And she goes, you don't have a quiet time, do you? I'm working on it. And he goes, no, you're not having a quiet time. Either you do or you don't. So what you just taught on convicted me so much. It's like, Lord, this is a holy time. And I'm skipping it. And then you're talking about, it's funny you were saying how many years you have. I'm be 68. And I'm going, Lord, the little time I have left is precious. I yeah. can't waste it. So yeah. thank you for reminding me that. And the other one was um, on your teaching of the Holy Spirit. Like, like, I need to get back. I mean, I do pray in tongues, but I do it more. But do you have a specific a teaching that you have that we can access? Like this other gentleman was talking uh, and there's other, there are other men who have questions and they're struggling with tongues. It's not, I just need to get uh, reinforced. That's what I'm thinking I'm saying. So if you have a teaching, uh, can you, you know, give us a website? We can go to it. Uh, you know what? Uh, since everything's happened, there were been gone from cassette tapes for a hundred years and we haven't, you know, I've been ministering to the church. I cannot tell you where I actually have it. I do know for sure at Jubilee and their archives I have at the church, I know I've taught a solid hour to two hours on tongues before, haven't I, Steve? And I know for sure that I've done like a whole message or two on 
you know, on thinking, on correcting wrong thinking, but forgive me, I just, if I can locate something that actually is that, that I can hone on, I'll ask some of our friends here, I will definitely find out about it and uh, send links to Steve so that he can get them to you. That's all I can say. I can't promise anything else. But yeah, it's it's crucial. But you know, there's wonderful books out there. The renewing of the mind, you know, the transformation of the mind. It does metamorphosize. Remember, that's what the word is, metamorpho, transformation. It means like, a, you know, we all know the old illustration, but it's so beautiful, isn't it? You go in like a caterpillar, like a worm. You enter this stage of chrysalis where there seems to be no activity. That's what happens when you first come to God. You get to a place, there's change happening, but you don't see it. But then you come out when you stay with it. I mean, if that worm tried to get out of that chrysalis too soon, he'd, he'd die a worm. But because he stays where he's at and he stays with it, he comes out on the other side, changed in form, function, and reality. He now has wings. He's able to fly, whereas before all he could do is crawl. There's so much, gosh, amazing stuff in that. But I'm saying there's all manner of books out there by on renewing the mind. John Bevere has a great book. And uh, gosh, I'm sure just about any minister you could name that's around has good books on thinking. I'm just saying, so please... Google, just Google it. I mean, they're out there. Just Google renewing their mind. And another thing that'll help, I'm sure, you know, Dave, I mean, it's Dave, Steve knows who, you know, you guys have probably heard of Dr. Caroline Leaf, right? You know, she is the woman who's a, a brain scientist. She's a, whatever it is, she's, you know, the blonde South African woman. And she teaches exactly, she's a medical professional as, of such a high degree. She has, a, I don't know how many doctors. And she does all those illustrative things where she shows exactly how God made the brain and how thoughts move to this and touch this. And then that thought touches this, which causes it to touch this, which causes it to touch that. And I mean, it's incredible when you literally see science back up exactly what God said. Go on YouTube, watch Dr. Caroline Leaf, L-E-A-F. And there's several things on there, but you've got, I've got to tell you, she talks fast. She's a scientist. You have to turn everything off. And you have to, again, learn how to listen. Just stop and get your pen and pad up and listen. I mean, listen and watch them about four or five times. Please train yourself to go over things more than once, please. I mean, anyhow, that's all I can say right now. Sorry. In fact, I want to just, I've got one more question. And Ed, go back and listen to this message because it was in this message the Lord spoke to you. So the message heard a second time, well, he'll speak further into you. And yeah. that's what I've done in moments when I've been really touched. I go back to the place where I was touched and it grows, it builds the authority. So this is the message and all the others then become the strengthening the addendum, but this message is yours. So own it. Just all of us, we can, you know, message heard the first time is never the, yeah. you know, it's just the introduction. Yeah. yeah. The door's open. I got one last moment for Mark. Go ahead. Question. Hi, Rod. Uh, I, I'm very loud. I hold this yeah. way. Um, really appreciate it. You don't know how much your uh, discussion on uh, being still. Um, that's something I've been practicing for 20 years. And mm. you just gave me justification. Recently, I've been feeling that's like the wrong thing to do. It's a waste of time. Um, <laughs> and I'm kind of confused. Not, well, let me, let me explain to you a little background. 20 years ago, I used to go to Quaker meetings. And you know, in Quaker meetings, they have a quiet, still time during the meeting for five minutes where they don't, everyone's just silent, no, no sound, yeah. nothing, and you pray. And um, I still do that on a daily basis. Uh, and I haven't been to a Quaker meeting since 2021. Um, but I still do that because it gave me peace. And I felt, that's the only time I've ever really felt that I've been close to God, if you want to know the truth, of all the things I do. That's the one I feel the closest with. <clears throat> but recently, I've been told by people around me and things that <clears throat> if you aren't talking and moving your mouth and voice come out, you're not praying. Yeah. You're yeah. Saying, saying quiet. And, and I'm saying, but I am praying. I'm talking with God, but, but I don't see your mouth moving. I don't see anything talking. I don't hear your voices. So I'm confused. Can you please give me some clarity on that? Because I feel like that silent. And I, when you say stillness, I quote mean silence. That's yeah. my stillness. It's silence. I'm not talking. That's the no, closest you're, you're, prayer I have to God. And, and I and I don't and and I and I like your word of petition. I always call it 
Santa Claus praying because I think people are asking for things from Santa Claus for a gift to present. And then when it's done, they say, amen, and they walk away. I thought, well, you just had a nice conversation with Santa Claus. Yeah. It's the, it's the, it's the other part, the communion. That's the important part. That's, and, and I only get that through the stillness. Can you please clarify if I'm right or wrong? Well, no, you're not wrong. What, but, how, how do I look at that? Thanks. Well, you're not wrong, but remember, it's not a matter of being right or wrong. It's a matter of just knowing the timing for what. What I mean is because, you know, there's, of course, you know, uh, if you like they say, if you have a praise in your heart, it will come out of your mouth. You know what I mean? We, we glorify God by what comes out of our mouth. So there's nothing wrong with that. But uh, of course, yeah, well, if people get upset or concerned because you're not opening your mouth, it's just that they, I mean, as politely as I can say it, they probably just don't have the understanding that we're talking about in this particular message. And um, they're still judging, as it were. They don't mean to, I mean, let's say, let's just take it for granted that they're good people, but they're operating in the knowledge that they have currently. And, you know, because some, that's to them, prayer, there's no such thing as praying without, uh, you know, making a lot of noise. It's like my Nigerian friends over here, you know, in the African churches I teach, and they, have a, they all have a prayer time. It's so funny. I've talked to several of the bigger pastors, you know, and they understand that he said their people, they tell me, and especially Matthew Ashimolo, who has one of the biggest churches in all of Britain. I used to do all of his intercession meetings for like 15 years, years ago. He got, he's the biggest church around, it's something like 17,000. But he used to say, it's so funny, he said, my people will come together, prayer time starts at 7.30. He said, the clock ticks at 7.30, and they start yelling in tongues. He said, they'll literally yell and speak and talk in tongues for until 9 o'clock for the hour and a half. And he said, the moment they stop, they stop at 9 o'clock, and they say, goodbye, everybody, and they leave. <laughs> and he said, it's like, you know, like he said, prayer is meant to be a monologue. You need to learn how to stop and wait after you. Otherwise, you're just... I'm just saying there's a place for both. So you should never be afraid of praying in English and praying out loud, because of course you have to understand that when a man actually knows how to talk to Jesus a bit, I mean, it's much, like I said, when I talk to Jesus, that is prayer. It's just that sometimes when you use the word prayer, like I said, people have this preconceived thought about it has to fit these rules. Um, no, it doesn't. So you're not wrong at all. Communion is prayer. But again, there's nothing wrong with praying out loud. Indeed, I mean, you need to because you have to also understand sometimes if you know the Lord, you know, when you're praying and talking to him, what you're saying is really helping others too. It's just that simple. You know, I learn, I listen to other people pray. I had to learn how not to judge. I'll be honest, you know, because God gave me so much. God, how do I say there's that sound like a pompous butthole? Um, you know, I had so much knowledge of scripture when God first did all this with me some 25, 30, actually 32 years ago now. I, it was very difficult for me to like, I led intercession for a huge church for a long time. And so I'd go to another prayer meeting and I would hear people and how they prayed. And I, I didn't want to be judgmental, but I was actually, I was judging I was just kind of weighing, as it were, everything. Well, that's not really accurate. They shouldn't have prayed like that. <laughs> or they shouldn't have done this. And I, I just had to sing about them because I was superior in knowledge. How sad, how embarrassing. But um, what I'm trying to get at is that, you know, you don't, you, after all, just really, everybody's at a different space. Everybody's at a different level. That's why the love of God is still the most important message in the book. We give people the space to entreat God as they know how to, you know what I mean? And you just have to get to the place. What set me free was I really, you know, we're not supposed to judge, are we, people? But Jesus said you need to learn how to judge righteous judgment. And he had to minister that. And he showed me the difference. He said, what I mean by learning to judge righteous judgment, righteous means right standing. He said, you need to be mature enough to judge what has right standing with God without judging the person. In other words, their action, their motive, what they say. If you're mature enough, you can weigh what they said. You know, like Steve has, has done this many times. You have. You've gone to another church service, and you've heard somebody say something, maybe the pastor of this church or some leader, and you knew the scripture in that area just better than they did. And you know that that really wasn't quite accurate. It wasn't what God was really saying there at all. But, you know, and you have an opportunity. You're faced immediately with a choice. Do I kind of, <laughs> he's stupid, or do I judge him, say I'm smarter than him, or, what, or do you just 
Okay, you know, just let it relax. Just don't panic, just relax. Have enough grace to say, well, that's where he is at the moment. And that's why we pray for one another, really. You know, we don't, God's given us commandment to bless, not to curse. And any speech against somebody is really a curse. It's just that simple. So I'm just saying, you're not wrong, but don't be afraid of praying in English as other. They're both right, but I'm just saying, don't let anyone, but at the same time, yeah, don't let somebody else bring you, uh, make you feel condemned or wrong because you want to be quiet. But also recognize when you're in a prayer group, some of those people, because they're used to that, you may be a greater asset to the overall uh, atmosphere of the prayer group if you, you know, add some prayer in English. That's all I'm trying to say. So you look at, we, we live for the good of the many. It's not about me. And now that's what I can share. Good. Rod, I'm going to ask, we, one of the things that you and I have both tried to honor, and Ed Cole was the one who taught about honoring time. We're going to be done in just two minutes. Sure. Actually, that's stretching an extra minute from what I see on the clock. But would you release a blessing over us? And I'd like us all to stand up here in the house and if you're anywhere. And let's let's receive, because I believe there's you carry that authority. Now, release the anointing, because we're going to go and begin to practice this, right? We're going to be grow the skill of stillness and knowing that he is God. Go ahead, please. Okay, just remember, effective prayer doesn't have to be long prayer. Father, we've just talked about you. And we talked about how you said to be still so that we're going to have a greater knowing of you. So I release life and blessing and the moral courage to have enough individual intention to seek this out and to follow through with this because of you will certainly show yourself strong. You will certainly bring revelation. You will certainly show them the fruit of this truth because it is your truth. Be still and know that I'm God. Not think you know him, but know him. So, Father, I truly release the revelation of that as much as I know how by the Holy Spirit, Spirit of the living God, Spirit of the living God, fall upon them, embrace them, Quicken their spirit to hear from you. Quicken them to this truth. Make it come alive to them that they might grab it and make it their own in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Rod. Thank you, Rod. Again, you're just our favorite teacher. Look forward to you coming back and being with us in person. And we'll do more of our gathering. So we want to thank you and bless you. And God bless all we'll of you, Jubilee soon. family. I love the Jubilee family. Bless you guys. Be nice to Steve. He's really a nice guy. And I will take down yeah. his pictures no matter what he said. Bye-bye.